I would like to take this opportunity to extend my warm gratitude to the Barclay Institute for having me come and participate in this very auspicious occasion. First and foremost, greetings and salutation. Good afternoon, everyone. When given this opportunity, I must say I'm grateful because this is the second time that I've spoken publicly after I left politics. The first time I was invited by the Barclay Institute and Mr. Frederick, giving me the opportunity to speak to some of you students on a message that I'm going to seek to repeat today because I think that the same message is relevant as it was yesterday, it will be relevant today and tomorrow. First and foremost, I have to say to Mr. Jacobs Matthews. Herbert Jacobs. Herbert Jacobs. Well, I asked him, who's your peoples? And he says, well, Heather Jacobs Matthews is my, is my granny. It makes perfect sense, though, if you know who Heather Jacobs Matthews is, you can see why this young man is a powerhouse. Yeah, man. I did not prepare a speech, but I did prepare some notes. So if I do lose my train of thought, I'll be able to revert. Back to those notes. The theme of this prize giving is academic excellence, the journey to a brighter future. And as I meditated on that theme, I said, well, that's good because it segues right into the message that I already want to repeat. It's a message that this young man spoke about. It's a message that I think that if, as students, you can grasp, you will have the seat to all human power. You will have within your fingertips the ability to be the masters of your own destiny. And because this is the Barclay Institute, and because I'm a Barclayite, please indulge me while I reason with these young people. Know that the same message that I'm giving to them applies to you as adults. The message does not change. Frankly, the fact that you all are here is testimony to the self-discipline and hard work academically that brought you and has brought you success now and will bring you more success in the future. But the theme says academic excellence, the journey to a brighter future. That means that this is just the start. Academic excellence is not the be all end all. In fact, how many of you can, re, can think of a person who is very bright, knows it all, but yet their soul seems to be cold? You know, we have enough bright people in this country. There are a lot of bright people who taught myself and your teachers at the Barclay and other schools. There's no shortage of people who excel academically. You would think that with so much academic excellence that the world would be a much better place than the way it is today. But when you think about it, when you meditate on it, when it comes to your family life, your community life, the life of this country, and even the world, the world is not a better place. It begs the question, if the world is being controlled and run by persons with high academic excellence, but yet it's so much strife, then what is the value of academic excellence? If the people are in pain, what that tells me is that you can have high grades and be the most highly miseducated person in the country. 
Because if you have knowledge and it cannot uplift yourself, your family, your community, and your country, then you are not truly educated. You have just stuffed bits and pieces of information in your mind that allows you to pass an exam. After that, you have no use to yourself or others. But I don't think, I don't believe that that is the case with you young people today. Listening to Mr. Farber Jacobs, <laughs> I'm certain that that is not the case with our young people today. So what is it that we are missing? What is it that we adults are missing? Whereas we are bright, and it seems like we have so much knowledge in our minds, but yet there's so much dysfunction in our midst. What can be done in the future for us to avoid the pitfalls of today? Allow me to give you a quote. And this quote speaks to what not academic excellence is, but what true education is. And this quote is by the former emperor and king of kings of Ethiopia, Atsi Haile Selassie I, where he says, education develops the intellect. An intellect distinguishes man from other creatures. It is education that enables man to harness nature and utilize her resources for the well-being and improvement of his or her life. The key for a betterment and completeness of modern living is education. But man cannot live by bread alone. Man, after all, is also composed of intellect and soul. Therefore, education in general and education and higher education, sorry, in particular, must aim to provide beyond the physical, it must provide food for the intellect and our soul. That education which ignores man's intrinsic nature or inner nature and neglects his intellect and reasoning power cannot be considered true education. So that should indicate to all of us that the truly educated person is not just an academically bright person. The truly education, educated person, sorry, is a person that is spiritually inclined. Spiritually inclined. How can I break this down as simply as possible? I gave this analogy the last time I was here, and so please allow me to give the analogy again. If you're on your bike and you're coming from Somerset and you're coming to Barclay and you are late, or in your, in your car, or your mother is in her car, and you are late, and you're coming from Somerset and you know in your mind that the fastest route to town is going middle road, but Something tells you to don't go middle road, go over the hill to South Shore. But then you say, common sense, it's faster to go middle road. I'm going to ignore that something in my mind that's that goes South Shore, and I'm going to go what, to the direction that logically makes sense to me. I'm going to middle road. And once I get down to Rising Sun Stretch, I hear a, a police bike. And that police bike is radar, and it comes up to you, and you know what happens. You got caught speeding. And the first thing you're going to say is, shucks, something tell me not to go middle road. Something tell me go over the hill. I'm sure all of you, or we adults can relate to what I'm saying. Something tell me not to go over the hill. I mean, sorry, to go middle road. The question that I ask you today is twofold. What is that something? And who is that something? What 
what it says something is what some people call their conscience. We all know what it feels like to suffer from a guilty conscience, don't we? You really can't sleep. You will never have peace until you square yourself with your conscience. The question is, the second part of the question is, now that you know what it is, who is it? I will posit to you today that that voice that told you to go over the hill, outside of being your conscience, that is also the voice of your creator. Don't ever forget that. And so here is the big battle. Here is the challenge that you're going to face as young people. Wherever you go in life, you're going to be presented with a choice. You must realize that as human beings, we are endowed with a reasoning mind. So you have two voices within. You have a voice that tells you to do what you like. And then we have another voice that tells you to do what's right. You can't hear both voices simultaneously. You can only hear one voice at a time, and guess what? The voice that tells you to do what you like is the loudest, most vociferous voice. That's the voice that screams. Go that way. Do it. Don't worry about it. Take the risk. It will be okay. Taste it. Feel it. Smell it. Whatever it may be, that's the voice that's showing you to go ahead and jump off the cliff. But then, you have this other voice, this more still, small voice within you that doesn't tell you to do what you like. It tells you to do what's right. The job of all human beings, the task of all human beings, young and old, is to know the difference between those two voices. And when you recognize the voice of the soul, the still small voice within that tells you to do what's right, you obey that voice unconditionally. Even if your parents or your friends tell you to do contrary, and that voice tells you to do what's right, always, always, without apology, always follow that still voice within. Always. And what happens when you learn to trust that still inner voice? You start to get to know yourself. You start to commune with your creator. You become obedient to that voice because that voice will never lead you astray. That choice will give you the power to be the most effectual leaders in whatever field or vocation that your academic training encourages you to enter within. That choice of doing what's right instead of doing what you like is the choice that will show you that you are an instrument in the hands of God. That is a true leader. Whatever you may do, whatever you put your hands to, you're guaranteed success. It's guaranteed because you know that you're being ob obedient to the person who created you. And you are following their will. Let me wind up by saying this. In the next 10 to 20 years, as you leave Barclay Institute, there's going to be an opportunity for you to step up and lead. Even now, you are called to lead as prefects in various capacities in school. But in the next 10 to 20 years, the burden of leadership in this country is going to fall on your shoulders. We are depending on you 
to get it right. We are depending on you to not mimic us as adults. We expect you to raise the standards in this country. Do not take it as what you see within us. That is the standard. That is not the standard. You are our children and we expect you to surpass our deeds. We expect you to be much better than us. You see, the truly educated person is a person that has a clear mind. Their thinking is elevated towards righteousness' sake. Towards righteousness' sake. And you know, if you choose to follow that still small voice, which is the source, the only source of power in life, then you will be able to bring or manifest the second verse of our school song that says, we are the men of the years to come. We are the women of the future. What will become of our island home without our nurture? For we have the brain and the brawn and the blood of those who have handed us the torch of life. And we pray that we aspire, emulate our worthy sires and to be heroes in the strife. That's not just a song. That's meant to be sung, to be meditated, and to be practiced and to put into real life. I'll tell you this. If you're able to rise to that level, then all that's required at that point by taking this academic excellence to another level is to think three terms. Think right. Think right. Speak the truth. And do good. Remember that that conscience that's within you exists within all your friends too. And it exists within all your fellow human beings. In fact, that's the only thing in life that you can say is equal. Because in this physical realm, there's nothing equal in this physical realm. The person sitting beside you is not equal to you in this physical realm. Even identical twins don't have the same fingerprints. So in the physical realm, life is about competition. What you put in is what you get out. You reap what you sow. But always remember that there's a higher calling. Remember that the spirit that dwells within you is the same spirit that dwells within your fellow men. So always think right. Speak the truth. And do good. And then your academic excellence will bear fruit in the future. Thank you very much. <laughs>